I, I will I will reiterate what I just said then. Um, so if it's if you have a strong base, um, you need it to either be in an aprotic solvent, like these examples down here with the TBU OK. Um, if and if you're if you don't have a solvent given, you can assume that it's an aprotic solvent, that the solvent's not playing a significant role. Um, if you do have a protic solvent, you want the protic solvent should be the conjugate acid of your base. Because if we did look what would happen if we did, uh, if we used methoxide, for instance, in water, we would have, we would have a side equilibrium reaction going on that lo would look like methoxide plus water is going to have some equilibrium reaction that makes methanol and hydroxide, where we just where the methoxide can pull the hydrogen off of a water. And so if you have significant amounts of both of the strong bases, if that's an equilibrium reaction that's going on, either of these could be a nucleophile now. And that means you're gonna get a mixture of the two products, of, of the product where hydroxide is a nucleophile and the product where methoxide is a nucleophile. But if you if your solvent molecule is the same is the the same molecule but protonated, if it's the conjugate acid, then when you go through that acid base, you still have an equilibrium process, but you're going to get the same products that you started with, right? If this methoxide pulls the hydrogen off of the other group, you're going to get methanol and methoxide back. Right? So anytime you're using one of these really strong bases, you want to pick your, it either needs to be an aprotic solvent so that there is no acid base reaction that can happen, or it has to be the conjugate acid of the same base. Because that means that you're only going to still only having one possible strong base there. If you don't do that, then you get a whole big mess of things. It's just, um, and that's not something that on a, on the timed test that I would that I would test you on. Like, oh, what solvent should this be done in? Um, but moving forward, that that might be a good quiz question or um, good take home problem. That kind of thing. So I could say, okay, now all of a sudden, if if you have your solvent mixed up. And I say, draw all your possible products. I just added three new possible products because now we have another nucleophile that could react as well. Um, and like, like you said, I'm not trying, I don't think I'm gonna, I did anything on the test that specifically is going to test you on that or, but it's, it's good to be paying attention to. Um, especially when we get into synthesis problems. Anybody else have anything from the study guide or just general questions? Yeah, I had one, Sean. Okay. Uh, for just 7.76 for the majors and minors, I, I didn't know. I thought it was like a little trick, but I'm not 100% sure if it works all the time. If you see a double bond kind of like going at the end of a chain, like going out, shouldn't that be a minor or is that a major? It will generally, so that would be the less substituted alkene, yeah, okay. right? Okay. Um, the, yeah. the exception to that is if you have a sterically hindered base, which in the most common one is that TBU okay, the T butyl hydro uh, um, okay. alkoxide because you wind up with that big T butyl yeah. group attached to the oxygen. And so it can't get in there and do, and do the Markovnikov product. You get the Hoffman product instead, which is the less substituted. Okay, got you. So if it's sterically hindered, then that's when you flip to the, mi the minor kind of is the major now, because that can actually happen more because exactly. of the space, that's it. Exactly. Okay, okay.
All right. Um, and basically, so all of these alk oxides are, let me go back to share screen here. All of these alk oxides are going to be com are strong, strong bases. Um, and then our, our book kind of draws the line that says, okay, well, this, the sterically hindered strong bases, we're going to consider them to be strong bases, but not strong nucleophiles because they're sterically hindered. They can't be a strong nucleophile because they actually can't get the active carbon. And so that's what not only does that favor elimination over substitution, it also favors the, the less substituted alkene as your product. So it kind of flips everything by switching to be the, um, the TBU okay. And I think, let me see if the, I think that that figure from um, University of West Virginia had a list of, it says, it says strong bases that are weak nucleophiles um, this is TBU okay. It's just without the K is the potassium, right? That just balances the charge. So this is the T-butyl group with an with an oxide and a deprotonated alcohol. Um, and that will also favor making the Hoffman project product is your major. The Hoffman, the less substituted. I was I was trying to find that chart in Canvas. Do you know where it's located? In? I may have I may have only left it in a in, in an announcement. Check the announcements. Oh, okay, All right. And that's a good point. I'll make and I'll make sure that I post that with the under week twelve. I think I have a couple of random resources. Um, I'll make sure I post it there too. And this is also a really good tool for, for studying too, because all every box in here, everything on this page, we you should be able to explain at least at some level. It should make sense to you at least um, when it comes to this, because we talked about all the different variables, right? It, the only thing that this doesn't get into is solvents. Right. And that's that's really like the last thing to consider is, is it a protic solvent and what does that do? Um, that's that's really like a tiebreaker when you don't have enough information from something else. So if it's secondary benzylic or allylic, then that means you could have any of our four mechanisms. Um, and if you can't decide just based on what the nucleophile or the base is, um, then you could look at the solvent and say, okay, well, that's going to make this, if it's an aprotic solvent, that makes this a weak base versus if it's an aprotic, and for instance, the, um, the strong nucleophile weak bases and fluoride would be on here too as well. These are, these halides are all considered strong nucleophiles and weak bases unless you're in a protic solvent and then they flip and then the iodine becomes a stronger nucleophile than the fluoride. If you're in an aprotic solvent, it's the other way around. And really with the, the halides is where we see that coming into effect the most is when is with the, those halides. Um, yeah. And again, that but that's that's a fine tuning your your products if you're trying to pick your majors and minors. It sh shouldn't be your first thought. Should not be solvent, which is tricky because it's the the thing that you might focus on studying the most because it's the trickiest. Um, but you have to remember, I know that this is happening in the background. I'm going to not worry about that unless I need to, despite the fact that you might spend a lot of time studying it. What else can I do for you guys? Actually, Sean, I don't know if um, probably won't get into it that much yet, but I was wondering about resonance and um, alkenes and stuff like that. 
Um, Because I feel like, yeah, wouldn't they be able to reorganize themselves uh, into different positions? And I was wondering, would it favor cis versus trans? And do we have to draw those combinations? Um, Yeah, I was just kind of wondering. I felt like we didn't go over that. Or maybe we we did, and it's just not important as we've made it out to be a it's it's like it's a lot like um the rearrangements that it is something that can happen but only in specific instances right um but it's a driving force that can make things um, that can actually cause rearrangements um if you wind up making a carbocation that is um that can rearrange to give you resonance so let's say we have, if we had this molecule and we thought it was going to go through a first order reaction, first thing that would happen would be your bromine leaves, right? And then you would get a positive charge here. Well, that's a secondary carbocation that's not unstable compared to a primary. Um, but despite the fact that it wouldn't be making a tertiary carbocation, we can actually see rearrangement happening here because it gives us resonance stabilization. So it would look like this. You'd move the hydride over, you'd have a hydride shift, and then your, your new intermediate would look like that. Um, so that's that's going to be way more stable because that positive charge being next to the benzene ring being conjugated with the benzene ring is a lot more stable than having a secondary carbocation that's isolated it's not going to the, all the different resonance structures are not going to affect where we're going to put our either where we're going to see the elimination happen um or where we're going to put our nucleophile in this case because we won't break up the benzene ring um, but let's see if we did, if we had that molecule, for instance, though, where it doesn't have a whole benzene ring, but you've got a double bond conjugated with the charge, this now gives us two places for a nucleophile to attack because either of the resonance structures can be attacked by a, by a nucleophile. Right? The other resonance structure would look like would look like that by just moving if you move the pi bond over to the positive charge to stay to fill this carbon's valence, it's going to leave a positive charge at the end here. So you can get, so if there is resonance, you can get more than one substitution product because you can wind up with it with your substitute, with your nucleophile attacking either of these two carbons. Okay, yeah. Um, and then I was, well, so, and obviously the, the top one would be more stable. It's more substituted. So that would be the major, right? Does Close. that come into play? It does. Um, but it's not that this, so this is, both of these are the intermediate, right? And so this would be the more stable alkene because it's more substituted, but it'd be the least stable carbocation. Right, because this is a primary carbocation versus a secondary. So your major product mm-hmm. would still be with the positive charge here, or would we would then have our nucleophile? Let's say our nucleophile is hydroxide. Our most, um, our major product would look like that. We would get we wind up attaching the OH to this carbon three in the middle here. Our, our minor product would attach the OH at the end. Yeah, okay. So yeah, more than I even thought about actually, okay. 
and and that's that's one of the reasons why we spent the time on like how do we rank these resonance structures by by stability back in the first half of the class is because it leads to us being able to mm -hmm. pick which one is the major product. Right, does that, I know resonance yeah. is one of those things that until you get used to thinking about it, it, all, it makes sense when I say it, but on a test it's, you know, you're likely to forget about it. Um, but don't, and that's, that's a little bit like the solvent side, right? It's a, it's a wrinkle, it's a detail that you should be watching for. But if you miss it, that's like, you know, minus one out of four. You still got most of the points because you got, if you got from here to the right product. Gotcha. Yeah, no. And then, I mean, what I was really thinking of is more, I mean, you, you answered the question just the same, but like, say if there was, it was, wouldn't be a benzene, but if we had like a, a benzene ring, but there was an oxygen or it was just not symmetrical, like, would it favor the cis versus the trans and stuff like that? But then you added, I wasn't even thinking about carbocations at all either. I was thinking more of uh, configuration. Oh, okay. So, so resonance no. is not going to change cis versus trans as far as elimination products because they can resonate uh, either way, right? So for the... Yeah. Well, that's why I started really thinking about because I know that it's kind of like, you know, it's a, a mixture of all of them at the same time, but I feel like it would still prefer to be cis because just of, um, I don't know, just kinematics, I guess you could say. I'm not sure if that's... Uh, just um, sterics. So that's what I was kind of thinking. Like it would still be in that um, trans configuration more often, I would think. Yes, you're right. Um, the only exception to that is if you only have one beta proton that you can pull off. Remember when we had to do those Newman projections to arrange everything so that everything was in the same plane for our, S, yeah. for our E2 to happen? That the only Very time that you're, that you're not going to favor trans, because both, like you said, both of these have the same amount of, of resonance here, and they both have the same amount of, of, of um, substitution. Um, so the, the only time that you would favor the cis would be if you only had one possible proton to remove in your elimination. Okay. Right, because that, that was the way that we could yeah. force it to be mm -hmm. that way, is it had to be that way for your leaving group and your proton to be pulled off at the same time. Okay. Hmm. And then, then that just matters, I guess, on the chirality of, the, of both of the substituent and the hydrogen in the first place. Exactly. And, That's right? Exactly I right. mean, I, I guess that, that, that would probably what it would be come down to. Right. That was that case where you had to have two Sorry, you broke chiral up there for carbons. A second. That was the case where you had to have two chiral carbons mm -hmm. that were a your alpha carbon had to be chiral and your beta carbon had to be chiral in order for that to matter, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're if they're both chiral, then that means that that your your starting configuration on the alpha carbon matters. And you, if your beta carbon's chiral, you only have one hydrogen on it. By definition. Right. And in that case, yeah. And then in that case, um, uh, resonance play wouldn't even be a factor. Exactly. Right. Because right. they're both going to resonate um, the same, I can't, the same yeah, way. I'm trying to... Yeah. Okay. So like if we had something like this, when our bromine leaves, if it's gonna go through E2, through a concerted mechanism, if the bromine is gonna leave at the same time as the hydrogen, which is facing away from us. And that means they have to be in that flat plane, which would, means we would have, we would want to draw it out. So if I draw it out with the, the alpha carbon in front, I'm going to put it so that the um, arrange it so that the bromine is down, which would mean the 
hydrogen would be to the left and the phenyl group, the benzene ring, which we'll abbreviate with pH, is to the right. So that's just looking at this carbon from this direction. And then I rotated it 60 degrees so that the bromine was straight down instead of off at an angle. And then the beta carbon then, we would need the hydrogen to be 180 degrees from the bromine. So our hydrogen would have to be straight up, which would mean down into the right would be our methyl group and down into the left would be our ethyl group. And so then when the bromine leaves with its electrons and the hydrogen is pulled off by a base, everything flattens out and we'll wind up with the benzene ring on the same side as the methyl group. Because all we're going to do when this happens is we're going to take it and we're going to flatten out what's left to make it planar. So we would wind up with a product in this case that looks like I didn't leave myself much room there. Um, where your methyl group and your benzene are, are cis relative to each other, right? And that's, the, that's not just the major product, that'd be the only product from E2 because it has to be that way in order for the, the hydrogen and the bromine to leave at the same time. And, but if one of these was switched, if I had the diastereomer where one of them was switched, let's see, the bromine looked like was going into the board instead of out of out of the board, we'd get this flipped because we'd wind up with one of these things. We wind up with um, these two things being flipped. The hydrogen and the phenyl group would wind up being flipped when we drew our Newman projection which means we would get the product where the ethyl group was cis relative to the benzene ring, right? So, but other than that, than the exception, the odd case where you have two chiral carbons next to each other, you're always going to make your major product will always be the one with your biggest groups away from each other, just because of the sterics. Right. Yeah, no, I thank you. Yeah, that that um, clarifies it. Because yeah, I wasn't thinking about yeah, just the way when it really mattered um, and what contributed to their like the automatic cis versus trans configuration and why it mattered in the first place. Yeah, resonance will wind up playing a larger role when we start getting into some some other reactions. Um, We'll go through some reactions that only happen if it's a conjugated diene, for instance, and and how it's conjugated will wind up affecting and what the resonance is will wind up affecting what the product is. Um, but for now, it's it's going to be the exceptions where that shows up. How are we doing? Anybody else have anything? off the top of your head i think the only thing i feel a little bit shaky on is just the determining different which reaction mechanism is going to be dominant but i think i probably just need to practice it yeah and and check the so check that figure at the end of chapter seven that had that um that color colored table um that's in a somewhat overly simplistic view of it um but if you that's a good place to start. And then that West Virginia figure that I'm uploading while I'm waiting for you guys to ask questions, basically, it's I just have to upload it and hit save. Um, what is is the, the one that's got a little bit more detail? And I like it better because it says favored versus, you know, it's all one of them versus another. Um, I, this is this would be a, a really good place to spend your time studying. Make this make sense to you. If this makes sense to you, 
and you can, um, when you just sit down and look at this, you can say, okay, I, I know, I know this, um, you know, why this happens like this, you're in a pretty good spot for the test. This is kind of has almost all of the, the stuff that we've been talking about. Yeah, I'm trying to put together like a Word document with all the tables that you're talking about and the nu nucleophile strength and stuff. Just quick reference, like, okay. Because I, I take forever to make that determination. I'm sitting there like, ooh, ooh, ooh. But so if you, if you know that, then when you're on the test, you might, you might want to um, do the other problems first. You might want to leave the, because, you know, for the mechanisms, I tell you what product. I say, draw the mechanism that goes from this reactant to this product. So you don't have to make the decision there. And for, for a lot of the other concepts, um, it's less relevant. So you might just want to get everything done except for the reactions part. And then come back to that and you can kind of, you know, do the easy ones, the ones where it's really clear cut, it's definitely this, you know, and then you can take your time on the other ones, leave the ones that you know take you a long time till the end. Um, and yeah, and it's never a bad idea to have a list. I have, I have an entire Dropbox folder full of figures for various classes that I, you know, that I share with you guys and put out there. So it's not a bad idea to have sort of a, a list or if you have the physical textbook, you know, go through it and put post-it notes on in there as bookmarks for all of the figures that you find yourself referencing all the time um, or the, you know, whatever explanations you always wind up going back to and need to reread. Um, you know, and also, I mean, it's, it's scary when a textbook costs a lot of money to write on it, but don't be afraid to mark up your textbook. Um, you might want to resell at the end at at the end of OCHEM, but the difference in price that you're going to get from a loose leaf textbook that you used for a whole year versus one that also has writing in it is not going to be that significantly different um, in all likelihood. Um, so I, it took me a couple of years of college before I was willing to actually write in my textbooks, but my textbooks that I always go back to still like my biochem textbook, my upper division stuff, I've got stuff written in all of the margins highlighted um, I still find like figures that I drew by hand or shoved into the pages in, inside it still and stuff like that. So, you know, use your textbook for sure. If you don't have a physical copy, then screenshot it and put it in a Word doc. All right, um, I'm also going to post the, um, I do have office hours every day, on, except Friday this week. Um, and since we, I'm not, not covering anything in Gen Chem, it's today's Gen Chem lecture time slot. So Tuesday and Thursday from one to three, I have office hours in our, our regular office hours link. Um, and I'll post that on the uh, week 12 um, tab on the Canvas shell too. So you can double check that. And on Wednesday, it's I think it's 2.30 to four. Um, and then by appointment outside of that, if you can't come in the afternoons or um, you can always either send me an email or just schedule an appointment at another time and, and let me know. Um, so you have time. Um, and so I, I, that's what I think we can. Um, does anybody have anything that they've thought about in the last five minutes? Okay, so we'll go ahead and end this now. Um, come If you think of anything today, come back to office hours or if you have questions about your grade or anything like that. Um, come to office hours one to three today um, or 2.30 to 4.30 tomorrow, 2.30 to 4, excuse me. All right. You guys are almost done. Keep at it. You're almost there. I'll see you guys soon. Thanks, Sean. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.